Well, good evening, everybody. This is my first time, by the way, back in the office. All right, you said something. All right. I'm Corey Murphy, the Chief Executive Officer of the American Society of Landscape Architects. And during this month in which we celebrate Asian American and Pacific Islander heritage, I have the distinct honor of welcoming all of you to our national headquarters, the Center for Landscape Architects. And as an organization based in Chinatown, we have the pleasure of welcoming our neighbors, the 1882 Foundation. Yeah. Woo! Right. We have been leading this neighborhood since 1995 when we moved here. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. This yeah. Is like, this is like a Baptist church. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, are proud residents of, we are proud residents of Washington, D.C., Chinatown. In 2007, when we began renovations of this building, we enjoyed collaborating with the Chinatown Review Board to ensure that we preserve the cultural legacy of Chinatown. An event like this, like tonight's, requires a lot of time and dedication. So I'd like to salute uh, Jen Lo. Tonight's conversation. And then we also give a special welcome to the executive director of the 1882 Foundation, Ted Gong. And so the senior manager for career discovery and diversity. We could work with Jen Lo and SLA behalf to bring us tonight's event. Some of you may know that a few years ago, ASLA developed a five-point race tracking plan of action who aims, whose aim is to address the system, systemic, systemic inequalities within landscape architecture. Moreover, when we developed ASLA's current strategic plan, we identified five focus areas, and one of these areas is community. So it just makes sense for ASLA to host this important conversation about the intersection of community, identity, and stewardship of cultural landscapes. And we couldn't be more pleased to welcome a distinguished panel of designers and artists from across two countries, the USA and Canada. So it's indeed a great honor to welcome our speakers. Landscape architect and fellow of ASLA, are you on? Who will be based designer again? Yen Pong. And artist Cheryl Yang Wong. Thank you. And now we welcome the 1882 Thank you very much, Tori. And also thank you so much, Lisa, and the AS Lake headquarters. Um, I'm very tickled that you all are here today in person. I have to say that Lisa mentioned to us. I believe like a month ago, this is the first in-person event in this space since the pandemic. Um, so it's really lovely to you know get to this point and be able to share space for you all to be able to invite us here um, as your neighbors uh, in the neighborhood uh, to have this conversation. And um, I will admit this uh, event is brought to you today as a mashup of different intersections of my own professional interests, identity, and my own research and project work. Uh, the 1882 Foundation, if those of you who don't know the organization, uh, is a cultural preservation education space uh, located just down the block, uh, right in front of uh, Chinatown Park, um, currently under construction right now um, as a result of an incredible Mellon Foundation grant to create a storytelling site. So how many years of the organization been so far? Um, uh, officially 10 years, right? Officially 10 years. Okay, 10 years old. Now the, the next Iteration, the future with the new space. Um, Omar from To Be Done Studio is working on uh, doing the renovations of that building. 
So it's super excited. I know it's been a vision for the organization of, for a very long time. Um, and I've been able to share space with the organization since 2019 when I met Ted and Gabby and Stan um, that really, you know, developed my understanding, appreciation of uh, this neighborhood through the lens of the people that I was able to meet, have conversations with, um, spend time with over the past few years. Um, and I really appreciate being able to work on a variety of different Chinatown projects with you all in oral history and mapping different places of memory of connectedness here. Um, it's informed a lot about the way that I work today. So I'm really grateful. Um, and I also want to acknowledge uh, all the, the 1882 folks here, Elin, uh, Nia, Gabby, Stan, Ted, May is not here, but you know, it takes quite a village to do the work that they do. <laughs> and they all do it as volunteers uh, and a very, very small amount of resources and funding, and they do a lot. Um, and this partnership with AFLA, um, my background is in landscape architecture, and the way that I see equity centered design work today in the spaces that I am is just really informed by my, my background in landscape architecture. So I really appreciate ASLA seeing how this program can really, you know, connect to the professional education and perspectives um, in our space today. Uh, additional context, happy AAPI Heritage Month. Um, and about a few years ago in 2020, uh, we actually came together for a virtual version of this conversation. Uh, it was a very different time. It was, you know, our first quarter in the pandemic. Days later, it was the murder of George Floyd. We were also experiencing extreme uh, increases in the violence and also uh, anti-Asian discrimination as a result of COVID. And so then we came together to talk about some fun urban design projects with a bunch of designers. Um, three years later, these conversations are a lot different. <laughs> and a different evolution of this conversation. And the, the intersection of the, the thing that I really am inspired to talk about and I feel it's really important to talk about are really reflective of the people that I brought here today. Um, I'm a bit of a fan girl. It is about designers doing work in a lot of different capacities. And that is both place-based work, but really deeply people-based work as well. And so we'll have a conversation at the intersection of people, of place, identity, of community, uh, of history, of culture. All of those things are intersect. They're super messy. And that scales the intervention of programs and arts and that scales the intersections of our planning scale and our policies as well. So with that, um, I'm also a design director at Openbox. Um, we are an equity center design space of uh, planning and research. And what we always, you know, uh, our belief is that you really need to acknowledge land, place, and people. So as a start, being able to root ourselves and acknowledge the place that we are in today, that we are in DC's Chinatown, a real Chinatown like every other Chinatown. Maya showing up a little smaller, looks a little different than other Chinatowns, but it is where we are. Um, and in Washington, DC, we are on the unceded territory of the Scattaway people. Uh, this place has been shaped by British colonists and French planners, and it's also the first majority Black city in the US as well. And you know, since 1975, with uh, Chocolate City has you know decreased in population over time, and as a result of increased development, the the fabric of the city has changed through gentrification, uh, through growth, through investment, disinvestment in other spaces. And in DC's Chinatown, also, um, is just one you know story, one history, and part of that larger fabric of the city as well. Chinatown once in the early 1800s actually was in Capitol Hill, and as a result of the development of the Central Triangle buildings, the, the government buildings and its development, subsequently moved to what we know today here in the city center as the Chinatown. Uh, today. 
Um, boundaries are fuzzy. Boundaries are always kind of fuzzy. And here in particular, there is a boundary of where that exists within sort of uh, the city planning. But this footprint is here. Um, and while today you probably see there's kind of moments of little shops of an acupuncture clinic, um, of people coming in and out of different residences in the Walnut House. It was a place where there was grocery stores, there was restaurants, there was business, there was laundry, there was public life as well. And so I brought these folks here today to talk about the Chinatown that they love because I know that there's people here today that also love this Chinatown as well. And I do appreciate the opportunity to learn from each other and to hear all the exciting things that are happening in other spaces and to share knowledge and projects. So, with that, I'm really excited to introduce first Bernie Wong. I'm from the bio for me, too. Um, Bernie is the founder and principal of the Site Design Group, it has been instrumental in the evolution of the firm as a multicultural, cutting edge design entity and fostering the landscape architecture profession in the city of Chicago. In managing the firm for over 33 years, Sykes has established a reputation for creative design solutions, developing thoughtful, community-oriented urban spaces, a strong proponent of civic and community engagement, earnings at the board of numerous service organizations and professional juries, including the, the Treehouse Award for Architectural Excellence in Community Design, Chinese American Service League, the chair of the Chicago Landmarks Commission, and uh, you see Ernie speaking like everywhere too, so it's <laughs> all over the place. Um, you know, universities, design uh, conferences, businesses, diversity conferences. Um, he was recently awarded the 2021 AFLA Community Services Award and the 2021 Daniel H. Burnham Distinguished Service Award from the Lambda Alpha International Land Tech Comic Society. Ellie chapter. And we also have Cheryl Wendy Wong, a New York based artist and trained architect working at the intersection of art, architecture, and the public realm. Cheryl's work investigates the transformation of space over time through sculpture, installation, and site specific architectural interventions. That activate underused public spaces. She explores how we can negotiate and share space together. Born and raised in Los Angeles, Shell received her BA in art and Italian at UC Berkeley, studied sculpture at Brera Academy in Milan, Italy, and earned her and earned her Master of Architecture from Columbia University at GSAP. She has completed public art installations with the New York State Thruway Authority, New York State Parks. Rose Kennedy Greenway Conservancy, City of Calgary, City of Inglewood, and Washington, D.C. Public Schools, amongst many others. Thank you, Cheryl, for being here. And Ian Kong, co founder and director of Nick Chinatown in New York City. She is a community based designer and curator living and working in Manhattan's Chinatown. Think Chinatown is the culmination of her work in urban design, museum, culinary and cultural instruction, and community engagement. Previously an urban curator of the Joshua Project, she consults a municipal agency in Beijing on urban revitalization strategies in the city's historic Hutong Core. She also spent time teaching at the Black Sesame Kitchen in Beijing and on board uh, semester at sea. She loves sharing Thomas Jefferson facts, which she picked up at her time working at Monticello. Yin holds a Bachelor of Architecture and Urban Design from the Bartlett School of Architecture University, College of London, and a Bachelor's of Arts and Urban Studies from Columbia University. Her work has been presented at the Venice Biennial of Architecture 2016 and the Shenzhen Biennial of Architecture 2007 and 2009. In 2019, she was a fellow of both the New Museum's Idea City and Coro's Neighborhood Leadership Program. In 2020, she was a David Prize finalist. Welcome, all of our panelists. And with that, I will welcome up Ernie to talk a little bit more about his work and perspectives, and then we'll have a little conversation, and then we'll do it again. Um, a couple of rotations. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, it is really good to see everybody here. It's really good to see this space more used. Yay! Um, oh, oh, we have a um, clicker. Okay. Yeah. Uh, oh, I forgot to talk about. Talk, keep talking. Talk, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We had a conversation about being able to situate this conversation in DC's Chinatown and acknowledge the history here too. Because I think what we understand is often it, get, it becomes really invisible to many people. Um, we all know New York's Chinatown, but do we really want to talk? We don't talk a whole lot about DC's Chinatown. And um, I talked about how there was movement. There is, it's not always been a safe place, boundary shift, change where people go. Um, it's also a racialized space, you know, places of exclusion is often where we find comfort and safety too, as well. Um, but I wanted to show some of these photos too of a, of a Chinatown you might be less familiar with. And these are photos with 1882 Foundation friends, Harry Chow, uh, Jack Lee, Penny Lee, um, Eddie Moy, um, about the public life, about celebration that used to happen here by families. There was kids playing on the streets. This was a playground for children as well. This was a place where there was grocery stores and those grocery stores were also safe third places where teenagers would also hang out. And there was volleyball on 8th Street and 7th at the Arches. Every year there was a volleyball tournament up until the early 2000s as well. Those volleyball Tournaments still happen up in Maryland with the Chinese uh, Youth Club, and lots of basketball happened then and continues to happen, but in different places right now. So that's just a moment that that's what I've learned through the people that I've talked to, the stories I've heard, the experiences I've heard, um, and I do believe that you know the work that you all have done as well um, reflects a lot of these same topics of conversations in different scales. We have Ernie. Ernie, <laughs> 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 right, talk to Gerald. Ernie, talk to you. Sure. Um, you know, one of the first questions that was asked was, you know, what inspires me? Uh, we're going to offer a now a 50 some person firm. In Chicago, I never thought that would happen. Um, I always thought about, you know, maybe being a four person firm, you can control everything, you can like, just keep it out, you know, what you want to take, etc. Or if you were, I didn't want to be a big firm, or I didn't want to have a big firm, because that's just the machine. So all of this, like, time before, it, I figured out that um, I had all the responsibility and no control. Um, but this is my family. This is me looking for another other parents from the dining <laughs> and, and my parents, when they came to this country from the Guangdong province in, in southern China, my father actually had done the fellowship to uh, send me great But we couldn't get his fellowship, uh, couldn't get his visa out of China that year. So the following year he got it, his visa, he was on his way up to Calais in Wisconsin. And stopped in Chicago and ran into a guy who literally meets that well. It's the uh, father of modern architecture in America. And so my dad ended up studying and working with Nice for 30 some years and then started his own practice, etc. My mom, on the other hand, uh, came to this country to do her residency at the university. They didn't know each other, they ended up meeting in, in North Carolina because. Uh, and took a summer off and started designing schools to, um, uh, outside of Durham. And they met and they got married because they were going to Chinese school. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. yeah. uh, here they are, and uh, as well as brother and sister, uh, and they were just um, uh, Chicago's Chinatown is, has a rich history. Uh, a little over 110 years old now. Um, it started really when the railroad workers uh, 
uh, ended up settling in Chicago, uh, started to develop their own identities in the South Loop. But very quickly, the real estate prices went up, and they had to also relocate down to uh, 22nd Street, which is a little further south. And so they established themselves in a largely uh, Lithuanian and Italian neighborhood, um, which was down there, and uh, sort of you know, continued to uh, thrive. And like other Chinatowns throughout the U.S., uh, continued to celebrate their identity and who they were um, through the businesses that continue to develop. Uh, you're going to see a lot of these, I think, in all of our experiments uh, here. So I'm going to kind of go through this really quickly. Um, but it continued to thrive. This is all now built designed by Swedish architects, by the way, which is uh, kind of funny. You know, so now we're at historic landmark. <laughs> uh, but recently, the most important thing that has happened in Chicago has been this effort to redistrict uh, um, the, the different wards. There's 50 wards uh, in, in the city of Chicago. And the redistricting actually meant that there was an ability to get a majority Asian board for the first time in the history of the city. And that came through a lot of community engagement and a lot of uh, reaching out to folks to, to say, you know, we need to have this, this Asian majority board uh, in, in Chicago. And so that effort uh, continued. And uh, this year, starting May 15th, there will be a new Asian ward in the city of Chicago. And along with that, yeah. Wow. Along with that is the first Chinese American and first female Asian American elected to city council, um, Nicole Lee. And it is just instrumental for us to celebrate that in Chicago uh, after 200 some years of not having a voice. Um, if you are familiar with Chicago, there are actually two Chinatowns. Um, if you understand the history of the Chinese in America, a lot of family associations that have developed all these different Chinatowns. Um, what I showed you before was the Chinatown, the larger Chinatown on the south side of Chicago, uh, was primarily the Onion uh, Association, which kind of ran that. They didn't get along with the Hipstein Association. The Hipstein Association moved up north and established uh, uh, this new Chinatown up towards Argyle Street, which has also been uh, recently welcoming to a lot of the Southeast Asians and uh, Vietnamese and Philippines. So, um, the work that we've been involved with has been really instrumental. I get in trouble because I call Chicago's Chinatown the architectural mecca of Chicago. I get in trouble. Because people are like, really? Are you Chicago? So, of course, architects. This is the building, the new Chinatown Library, which is designed by SOM, who designs every high rise in the world, right? We are famous for that. But this was celebrated as the third best design in the world uh, for a tiny, tiny library that is now used seven days a week in the city of Chicago. But it also gave us the opportunity to connect uh, the historic part of Chinatown to a newly developing part of Chinatown, which is Chinatown Square. Chicago's Chinatown is actually one of the only Chinatowns that continues to expand. Uh, the, um, the, the population continues to increase. The uh, demographics is really interesting because there's Archer Avenue that goes southwest, which has been uh, this organic drive of affordable housing that continues down that uh, that corridor down to Midway Airport. And so the population has continued to grow. More immigrants come to the city, and Chicago's Chinatown continues to thrive. A lot of the businesses continue to turn over. They get bought out by new immigrants. Um, and so the city has invested a lot of money into new roadways and uh, the library. And one of the exciting things that happened was 20 years ago when we did in town before that part. This was also cut off from the rest of the neighborhood by a railroad, uh, but it also had this asset of being 
of the Chicago River. Uh, this is the Dragon Boat Race. Our Dragon Boat Race is going to be June 24th in Chicago. It's incredible. I'm telling you that because they made me share this. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, but it is an oasis that people uh, go to this park and they try to discover it. And, uh, oops. Even though I wasn't raised in Chinatown, I, I, um, I was raising my family here in Chinatown. Um, my, my kids learned to ride their bike on a busy sidewalk. And I had friends that grew up in Chinatown. They, they would play volleyball using a fence at the schoolyard. And so basically the sidewalk was their, was their playground for many years. Seeing how, how so many generations of kids kind of grew up without a park, I, I think it's something the community really needed. It was probably the first time that the community really got together and, and asked the city, you know, we, we lost our park. It's time to restore it and rebuild it. My dad, along with some of his friends, uh, wanted to expand Chinatown. The Santa Fe Railroad was willing to sell some land to my dad and, and the company that he started. And along with that, he wanted to see if there could be a park as part of that project. How do we start to really connect with the cultural aspects of this park? That's where we really started with this whole uh, effort, was looking at classical and traditional Chinese garden design. You keep on discovering these landscapes as you move through these courtyards and these series of courtyards. Our park is is kind of bisected in the middle by the 18th Street Bridge. Those walls under 18th Street were were always either filled with graffiti or just painted over, raised enough money to paint three of the four walls that are under 18th Street. It just represented that, you know, even though we're from different places, uh, we, we could be one. When you got to the edge of the river, there was a 15 foot drop from land to the river. And people do gravitate towards water. Part of this was carving away a much more gentler sloping edge that people could access the river even easier. There's this whole balance in the site of digging out areas, yet taking that soil and being able to mound it up and create better topography. I think that there's like such a weird trajectory of like what happens when there's no a general lack of places for healthy activity, but also for a sense of safety. We try to hold this like very special event a couple years ago where we invited the community to plant native plants into the park. There was a sense of community. There were so many people that like they were helping each other out. That is what a true community is all about. We are in a field that um, that historically has been for rich people, doing the estates and you know English gardens and French gardens, and to transform that into something that the everyday person can experience, I think is really important. Good design. And the quality of design should be for everybody. Not only uh, the quality of design in the industry, but the social aspect of it. How does this start to impact other people's lives? So when we do a park on the west side of Chicago that used to be drug infested and the needles all over the place, and that kid, and we put in a new playground, and 20 years from now, that kid says to his friend, hey, remember that park that we were at where we did this and we dreamed about this? You impacted that kid's life. And that's powerful to me. That's something that I am very passionate about. The 
this park is making a difference in people's lives. Thank you very much. Um, that was a great video. What that? How did you make this video? Where did, what was the origin story of the video part? The video actually is coming. Can you tell us a little bit about that journey, that process, even before to getting, you know, the design you started in? Like, what communities were intersecting? What were the conversations like? What, what they really started with. Uh, there was a part of the challenge that I used to have uh, years ago, designed by the Olmsted Brothers. So, first of all, Sons designed this part, Garden School Park, which was growing from the expression of what do there. And Chad had a little park. They, they had left with a little postage stamp of tax society and park uh, alongside the highway. So, it was like just a terrible space. There was absolutely no green space in Chad and so the opportunity to have a green space that this community talked about was truly important. Um, the Yeah. 
between these two disciplines. So in my work, I'm really interested in making spaces that change over time and to really explore how we can negotiate and share space together. Often this takes shape as human scale sculptures and pavilions that respond to a specific place or that activate an underused public space and perhaps host public programming. And sometimes these structures happen to be also large scale sundials. Sometimes my public artworks are created for and installed in educational institutions, um, like several percent for art projects that I've done in the past years with Washington DC public schools. Uh, there's one at uh, Murray Reed, there's one at Jefferson Middle School and another one coming at Smothers um, Elementary School. So this work here, it's called Portal, really aims to empower students and honor cultural figures of color by memorializing their quotations at the entrance of the system. Sometimes my artworks create new community hubs with colorful seating and brown murals and experiment with new material applications. I work often with engineers and fabricators in my process to make projects come to life and have also been collaborating with lighting designers on public artworks that really integrate lighting and interactivity to create not just sculptures, but experiences in themselves. So this project current responds to the motions of passersby with light animations that play across the sculpture. And this is at the new tap of the bridge. There was a formatting issue when I exported this from Keynote. So just imagine that these white swatches at the edge are dark. <laughs> <laughs> you have to use a little bit of imagination with the formatting. Um, so the lighting of this project, Common Ground, which is up in downtown Brooklyn right now in New York, is responsive to environmental audio, like voices or traffic or car honks or footsteps, just really important for you to be present there with the artwork. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of Chinatown-based public artworks. So in recent years, I've also been doing some public artworks in the US and in Canada in Chinatown. 
This project called Ziggy is a pair of long wooden benches, and it was installed in Calvary, Chinatown, where the corners and the nooks of the benches really invite us to play, to pause, and to interact together. They were first shown at a Chinatown block party and then were moved afterwards to their permanent home at a local senior residence. On the right side, we've got the adoring fans of the artwork that they say that a hard wooden surface is completely good for the tush. <laughs> <laughs> no, they really said that. Oh, that's a quote. <laughs> so, Year of the Tiger, which is in Boston, Chinatown, um, is a site specific public artwork and community pavilion composed of colorful seating, podiums, and floor motifs. And this was commissioned by the Green Bay Conservancy of Boston and the Powell Arts Center. So, the idea is that it embodies the dynamic and bold spirit of the tiger, which was last year's Chinese zodiac animal. However, it is still up. And the installation really appears to leap across the park. As both stage and seating, it creates a gener intergenerational hub uh, to gather outdoors, to perform in, or to really engage in programs. It also honors the legacy of Mary Suhu, for whom this park is named. And she was really a longtime resident of Boston Chinatown. She was an ardent community advocate who dedicated decades of her life to really foraging public and recreational spaces in Boston and Chinatown. And just to know that before this project was installed, this side of the park was a pretty drab gray space without that much seating for Chinatown residents to gather. So since it's been up, it's really transformed the space. In the interest of time, I deleted the slide with the video of this project, but I think a lot of, I would just mentioned a lot of my artworks, it's, it's a little bit hard to show just one still. They're also about the kind of programming and the interactivity and the change over time that happens. So this pavilion uh, really made the space for public programs, but also for casual encounters, socializing and hanging out. And the idea also is that when it's installed later this year, the goal is to make a longer lasting contribution to public space. So the bench is separated, rehab, touched up, and then donated to local Boston Chinatown community organizations. So there's an after too. All right, so back to Chinatown. Can you find me in there? <laughs> so I've had a long-standing connection to Chinatown in the U.S. And for me, I, I grew up in L.A. Chinatown, and during my childhood, we went on bi-weekly trips to L.A.'s Chinatown with my parents, my sister. That was where we had our dim sum, our Chinese baked goods, our groceries, and really a connection back home to my parents, back to my parents' ancestral homes. Um, I'm also connected to New York's Chinatown. That's where I live now, uh, a couple blocks away from Yin. And my daughter goes to school in Chinatown in a bilingual Chinese English program. So did you find me? <laughs> Silence. <laughs> All right, that little cutie in the red dress in the front. <laughs> So the last few projects I'll be showing are really Chinatown research-based projects. And, and the artifacts of these projects are really digital artifacts. So this one is called Musings from Chinatown, Harry Pandemic Notes on Resilience. And this is a bilingual Chinese-English digital publication featuring text, stories, and images from Chinatown community members across North America, including Yin, uh, who has a contribution in here. And so the theme of this publication was really how to stay resilient and remember the stories of our Chinatown. And on my website, you can download this free um, and take a closer look at it. So this is, uh, this project is called Reflective Urbanisms, Mapping Calgary Chinatown. This is also one that uh, you can spend a little bit more time uh, on this project uh, on desktop or laptop. It's preferred. It's reflective-urbanisms.com. And this is really an interactive multimedia website that's part of a continuing series researching Chinatown buildings across North America. And it brings together my interest in exploring how spaces can change over time and how community stories are connected to our architecture. It's really the culmination of over two years of research, of modeling, of web programming, and it was done initially as part of a residency with the city of Calgary and the New Gallery. 
So in this project, I'm mapping Calgary Chinatown through its architectural changes, through changes that have occurred in its buildings, but also through the family stories about the different kinds of eras of these buildings. And it's really a restorative history project, one that aims to build community empowerment through sharing stories and through creating an architectural archive that honors and connects these stories to the building. So on the website, you'll, you can fly around a 3D model of Calgary Chinatown, and you can see visualizations of different buildings, chapters, renders of the different facades that really tell us a story about changes in ownership, changes in era, and social and political changes. You can also read interviews from community members, read stories from community members about the building, and I'll and see photos and architecture. So at the start of this research project, it was literally just before the pandemic struck um, in 2020. I had the fortune of being able to spend a couple of months on ground in Calgary, Chinatown. Here, I met with and spoke to different community members, interviewed them, these stewards, former residents, architects, and owners of these buildings to really capture their experiences, their history. And with all of these, I was also taking portraits, photo portraits of the person with their building. So by observing the building in its current state, we can understand quite a bit. But for me, it's also about piecing together the clues on what the building was like before and how it's changed over time. So my process also involved looking at old architectural drawings to find ways that the building has been modified. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an example, a little bit of a deeper dive into one sample building and in Calgary Chinatown, and this is what is today the Visions Eye Care Center building. So this building was formerly called the Linda May Block. It housed the Linda May's coffee shop, a gift store, and a restaurant. When you see old photos of Calgary Chinatown back in the 50s and the 60s, this is one of the most iconic buildings that comes up. So in this process, I was introduced to Carol and Jasmine Poon, who are two sisters who grew up in Calgary Chinatown next door to the building. It was their grandparents, Chong Him and Arlene Poon, who opened up uh, and owned Linda Mays in the early 1950s and were really important community figures in shaping Calgary Chinatown during this time. So during one of our interviews, uh, you know, sometimes we would have drawing sessions that would trigger memories. And so this is a sketch that was drawn by Carol from her childhood memories of growing up in the coffee shop. So in drawing up the plan, she really, you know, recalled spending afternoons after school in the cafe, you know, thinking about where was the soda fountain, where were the pie store, you know, what was on the menu. And so I think there's this other aspect of these details of life that really don't get included when we're just at just a real plan or just a photo. So it's really all of these details of life that become part of this history, this living history. So within this research, we then created 3D digital models of the building's iteration to really tell a story about how the building has changed over time. So here in this animation, you can see the five major chapters so far within the life of the building from like the early 1900s when it was the boarding house to being rebuilt as Linda May's coffee shop in the early 1950s to when large scale neon signage was put in, a trend of the time and so on and so forth. And so finally, over the last year, I've been developing the New York version of the reflective urbanism of this project series with support from the Laundromat Project and my alma mater, Columbia University, GSA. And I'm going to show you a little bit of the work in progress with that. So, although New York's got multiple Chinatowns, some say seven, others say nine, say 91, um, <laughs> I'm focusing here on the oldest one, which is Manhattan's Chinatown. And while archival documentation really helps us to understand a place's past, there are still large parts of Chinatown's history that are missing. So these buildings aren't just structures, they're really sites of resilience for generations of community members. You know, many of the personal stories of the people who lived, 
and worked in, who built and renovated these Chinatown buildings, they haven't been reported. So let's remember one thing. There is a bittersweet reality to the history of Chinatowns. They're enclaves founded upon history of racism and exclusion. And you know, they have over time though flourished into vibrant communities. But since the start of the pandemic, uh, you know, this is the first time this is mentioned tonight. Uh, in fact, I think everyone's gonna mention it, but we've had <laughs> racist anti-Asian rhetoric and violence, which has disproportionately impacted our Chinese. And Manhattan's Chinatown is shrinking now. Elders are passing away, and it's really a crucial time to remember our stories and rewrite our own history. So with this project, initially, I observed the buildings and started to document them from different perspectives. And the idea is that, you know, really a building facade has so much meaning. This is how a building announces itself to the world. It's how it faces the city and tells us who it is. So there's so much we can understand from the exterior of the building. What does it say about who it's catering to? What does it say about ownership? How do we enter a building? How do we look inside it? Not. What do materials tell about a building's past? How do ornamental features communicate stories about culture? Is the signage a major feature or just a little subtle mark on the building? And really, how does the building announce that it's part of Chinatown? But it's not just the exterior of the building, it's also about the details of life inside the building. So these photos were taken inside of different buildings and many within family association buildings. Bernie mentioned associations, I'm going to return to that. So but these associations are really community organizations whose members are tied by a commonality. Sometimes it's the same ancestral village back in China. Sometimes it's a last name. For example, the Li Association or the Wong Association. You'll start to see these names on the outside of the buildings in Chinatown if you haven't observed them yet. So many of these associations have over 100 years of history in Manhattan, Chinatown, and they purchased their building in the early 1900s. They've been historically lifelines for new Chinese immigrants, and they really form a deep part of Chinatown. They've been a place for support for where to get your first meal, where to stay when you have nowhere to go, how to fill out your paperwork for American citizenship. So today, with Chinatown's footprint shrinking, it's even more important that these family associations are property owners in Manhattan's historic core. So for me, being in sight, invited inside these buildings and documenting them has been a really emotional experience. These interiors really tell us so much about Chinatown's community. They tell us about how owning a building in the city also means feeding a village. Many association buildings have an industrial kitchen to prepare feasts for special occasions. And all of them, at the very, very minimum, have one carafe of tea, one carafe of coffee, and a warm pot of rice. So members never, never go hungry. They tell us about how a family shrine has historically been one of the first dedicated spaces within these buildings, how the goddess Guan Yin and a legacy of ancestors are remembered and worshipped here. They tell us about how guidance is given on life's mysteries through fortune telling. If you ever need life's answers, just go to an association building and do this fortune telling. It really solves all of your problems. <laughs> How past leaders and predecessors are honored, their portraits on the walls. How teaching is also a form of community remembrance of keeping Chinatown strong by not forgetting its more challenging times. In the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association building at 62 Mott Street, the history of Chinese immigration in America and the founding of Chinatown is remembered in a public permanent exhibition on the second floor. So as part of my research, I also held like in Calvary, Chinatown, I held community storytelling sessions where the public was invited to share their stories of Chinatown building. And this duo benches was designed to host these events. Following the events this past spring, they were donated for use at Chinatown community events. So on Doyers and uh, Hell, you might still see them around. Again, I also spent time on, I wanted community members to record their stories and to photograph their portraits within the building. So currently, 
We've completed the modeling of current day buildings and are working through the past iterations of these buildings. So just showing you some of the work in progress renders here on historic Mott Street. Looking north. And looking south. And we're also creating models of past iterations of the building to really see visually how they've changed over time. So if we take a closer look at 41 Mott Street, we can see the building's different chapters and how they tell us a story about changes in ownership of the local area. I just want to share a couple of interesting notes about this building um, from my interview with Carrie Colain, architectural historian who Yin actually introduced me to over a very delicious lunch. Um, so in the 1920s, this building was the first new construction, so not just a repurposed building, a new construction by a Chinatown Association, the Onlearn Association. Ernie mentioned this association as well. They have different branches, the New York version. The New York branch um, commissioned this building, which really demonstrated their economic and political power at the time. By the early 1940s, the sixth floor pagoda-like roof was really reworked into this highly ornamented marquise that expanded the top floor meeting spaces. Clearly, we have economic power to be making these renovations. And in the late 1940s, they decided to commission their new building headquarters up the street at 83 Mott, which is today a very um, well-known building in Peter's Trent. So by the late 1970s, they sold the building at 41 Mott to the Lee Family Association, who remodeled it in the early 1980s to the building you see today. Here. And if we look into the Lee Association itself, go into their space, we meet Ho Q Lee, who's at the center of this photo. He's a former president and a current elder and building steward of the Lee Family Association. During our interview, he really described his journey immigrating from Hong Kong to <laughs> New York Chinatown in the mid 60s as the Immigration and Nationality Act of five really start to open up large-scale Chinese immigration to the U.S., which before had been really severely restricted by the Chinese exclusion. And Ho Q Lee really took over his father's poultry business and battled years of racist politics with the USDA that prevented him from selling chickens slaughtered in a style requested by Chinese restaurants. At the age of 61, he decided to sell off his buildings his business and focus on the Lee Association. He is still currently a very important elder with the association. Finally, I thought it would be fitting to end with this photo of four generations of moms and the cutest baby you've ever seen in your life. You all need to agree mm -hmm. that it's my daughter, but this is an objective statement. Um, and just to say that this reflective urbanism series is really a part of this body of resilience work. It's responding to the hardship our Chinatowns have endured in recent years. And while this project doesn't really resolve all of these challenges, I believe that we can build community resilience and further cement Chinatown's cultural legacy by documenting the histories of this systematically marginalized place and its people. Thank you. Thanks, Cheryl. Incredible work. Uh, really research. And I do have to ask, you have incredible documentation, photography, you did a lot of interviewing. Why did you decide to make many models to be your social work? <laughs> well, you know, when you come Chinatown, like I show you, a, I, sh I go deep, I deep dive into the process of the New York reflective urbanism. But the process has been the same in other Chinatown, it's just that it's deep. And I feel like the architectural models show something that nobody has ever shown. That's it doesn't exist. It takes a lot of work to put together, like you know, analyze this floor plan, get this photo from this, you know, family member and join them and interpret it architecturally. But yet these changes are all things that tell us so much about these you know, overarching patterns of like political and social changes, economic power. Um, and I think that that's a big focus of the project is, is 
memorializing that architectural history. It just is not there. You go to city archives, this stuff is there. I mean, all of this history is in absent. And so I think it's important to bring it to the world. It's there, it's just without expressing it. Also, you know, it's only facial things are not. Yeah, I, I think this is a beautiful Sorry, we all, I, I turned off my mic in case I went to the bathroom. <laughs> so let's just make sure this puppy turns back off. Can you hear me? Okay. Or maybe I'll just use my big girl voice. Big girl voice. <laughs> um, yeah, incredible research. What, can you tell us a favorite story? I would say that the project I showed in Calgary, Chinatown with Carol and Jasmine Poon, the two sisters, it was just my favorite time with them, right? And I think part of it is they were so open and so willing and they had such a deep history with one of the most important buildings in Calgary, Chinatown. So, you know, even sitting with them and hearing about simply like, how has the menu changed over time? And what did you serve? And, you know, here, okay, like in the coffee shop, we had like, you know, it was more Western food, right? You know, pies, a jukebox, 15 music going, a soda fountain, ice cream floats. Y'all getting hungry, I see it. <laughs> um, but then in the restaurant upstairs, they had all these really interesting dishes and Canadian Chinese food, is similar but also has its differences from American Chinese food, Americanized Chinese food. And they had something, I remember her describing this thing that was like smashed shrimp that was then deep fried into the shape of a donut. It all sounds incredibly delicious. I have never seen it here. But all of these small little details about foods that you can't find anymore, dishes you can't find anymore, the kind of labor of love to prepare these. It's just not done in the same way. So I think those little parts get folded into me feeling the fondest with them. In addition to the fact that Carol just became a really good friend. At the time I was I was pregnant um, and expecting my daughter. And so it was a really wonderful way to connect. She was very supportive through that experience. That question about your, your physical work, your physical projects, intervention in different public spaces. You mentioned change over time also relative to those pieces of work. Is there any reflections, observations, or taking your work from like early installation to sort of how it's been adapted to people move around it? Has it stayed there? Part of the fabric? That's a good question. I I think that it's always changing. And I think that for me, that's part of it. It's it's about putting artwork out there that to me is not passive. It's creating spaces that take on a life of their own. Like they become community spaces. I think, you know, for example, there was one project in New York that I I lived across the street from so I would have to check it out really often. And um uh, and one time I found a line dancing troupe practicing on it. And I just thought that is that's so, so cool for them to just figure out that this is, you know, a place to do that. Um, so I think, again, I think part of it is I love activating these projects with public programming. Um, but I also think that it's about these unexpected moments of people finding it know, as a, a stop on their daily walk, or a place to meditate, or a place to, you know, uh, like Dungeons and Dragons uh, is uh, is really interesting. Well, any surprising pieces in public spaces? Um, not surprising, but surprising is obviously there has, it's, it's happened very rarely, but there has been some graffiti, and I will just say someone decided to use, like, or something will more important to etch their phone number. So in a way, I think, um, you know, or, or someone you hate that you have their phone number. Maybe that makes sense. But. 
So that was an unexpected. The, the line dancing was a really unexpected. That would be or any unexpected. It changes all the time. Thank you so much, Cheryl. And that's yeah. I do this in my own space. I guess we last or like we can do like a was it ninth inning, seventh inning? <laughs> <laughs> we can get up for seven, <laughs> get up for seven, <laughs> shake it out. It's uh, very nice here. They have nice chairs in the back. In my space, we have the Chinatown like plastic school that staff. <laughs> um, so I'm Yen, director and co-founder of Think Chinatown, a uh, We're a place-based organization and intergenerational organization in Manhattan, Chinatown. And we work at the intersection of storytelling, art, and neighborhood engagement. So just a little bit, Jen asked us how, you know, what informs our work. Um, a little bit about me. So I moved around a bit as a kid, but I actually grew up not far from here, in Montgomery County. So this Chinatown was my first Chinatown I interacted with. But mostly, you know, if you know Montgomery County, you know the Rocco Pike and you know the grocery store is there. It's that kind of what I grew up with in Japanese school. Um, academically, I'm trained as an urbanist. Um, prior to thinking, starting to think, I worked in architecture offices. Um, here are some pictures of my work through approach architecture. I was consulting in Beijing, the municipal government there on best practices for urban revitalization in the historic Hutong Four, the neighborhood of Bachelor. Um, and I have a background in um, cultural education to food as well. Um, so back to my work in the Chinatown, um, you know, I real I think Jen wanted me to focus on our multi-pronged approach. Um, and I really do think it takes that 360 understanding of them and, and acting within our community to move things forward. Uh, I really believe that the process of listening, reflecting, and celebrate develops the community cohesion that we need to work on um, larger issues and really build that trust. Um, through practice, our practices, um, we can grow our community, strengthen our community, um, so that we can shape our, public, our policies to better define our public spaces. And also support our ecosystem and advocate our ecosystem of small businesses and innovate how our cultural heritage and collective memory is represented. So I'll show you some examples. Um, our more I guess, visible ones are um, public space activations. These are really popular for one, the Chinatown Night Market. It's a summer series of food, art, and music at the iconic gateway of Manhattan Bridge. Um, it began in the pandemic response program with this amazing program called the Neighborhoods Now Project. If you don't know about it, look it up. Um, Van Allen and Urban Design Forum ran it. And basically, they got all this pro bono support, design, lighting, um, legal support, and let the community organizers lead projects. Um, so they basically gave me money and all these human resources before I told them what I wanted to do. <laughs> And we had this idea to do this night market for years, but we didn't really have the capacity to do this. So all of a sudden, we had this amazing team, and very quickly, we were able to put together this large-scale uh, community event. It was so important for us, if you remember the dark times of you know, 2021, 2022, uh, 2020, um, where uh, you know, we're really focused on pandemic recovery, really thinking about creating safe spaces, especially in that time that anti Asian hate incident spike. Um, this was our way of seeing our public spaces, the way of creating safe spaces in our community. Um, and now we're gearing up for our third year, um, you know, still supporting our Chinatown and API small and micro businesses. Uh, we're always very careful with our selection to keep the market relevant and affordable to the community. 
And there's so much extra work to make that happen. But if in language outreach, in language support, um, you know, helping uh, vendors get their food handling licenses, um, thinking through their point of sales, curating their menus, a lot of them is their first time doing these event based um, event the sale. So another really public uh, event we do is the Chinatown Arts Festival, formerly known as a week, because now we have come for the whole month of October. Um, and, you know, really, maybe in this room, we understand this as the practice of placekeeping, uh, but it draws people to our neighborhood and it deepens our connections and our belonging to this cultural home. Um, and Cheryl showed us like how many people find such deep connection with this neighborhood. Um, and it gives people a, a reason to like maybe drive them to New Jersey if they want to do something. Um, so we also understand that art can be a gentrifying force, especially for where we're located. You know, Chinatown Manhattan, where between Tribeca and Lower East Side. And the galleries were just like creeping in towards us from both sides in Soho. Um, and so we're very careful. I'm always very careful about selection of programs that will speak to a wider cross section of our community. And so something we always think about is what would aunties like to see? But we could even take it a step further and how can we also include her? How can we honor? Her work, and you know, a lot of them are uh, cultural practice practitioners um, in the community. We work with this Fujianese Opera Group, who do amazing work, um, but often people don't get to enjoy their performances because they're usually in the basement somewhere, um, not very public. So we give them these stages. Uh, we give them this opportunity to be showcased. Another really visible project we had, uh, a pandemic response project, was Assembly for Chinatown, where volunteers came together um, to quickly figure out the regulations and build outdoor dining for restaurants in need in Chinatown. So this was a very volunteer-based effort. We also had the support of this great group, A plus A plus A Studio. And we have over 15 sites, um, supported over 20 businesses and counting. This year we've evolved to demolition and removal. So we're always there to support the whole life cycle of our projects. Okay, so the less visible projects really, uh, and maybe like more long-term and impactful projects uh, really revolve around the core of our storytelling. Um, this is where we help bridge that gap in knowledge. I know Ted is really passionate about this, but there's a huge gap in our knowledge about Asian American history, Chinese American history, which is a long lasting impact from the Chinese exclusionary laws and also the impact of the trauma of disruption of immigration. So there's a lot of work to, um, you know, and not only uh, collect these stories, but also to encourage people to share them. And so one way we do that is work with artists to honor these stories. And uh, we've seen that uh, more people are willing to share their stories after they see one of our projects. So I have a short clip for you all. Yes. The story goes, my grandfather was told by a fortune teller, you have to go as far away as you can from this place. You will never succeed here. And that's probably why he was so persistent. The first time he was here, he was picked up, sent back to China, regrouped, got back on a boat and came here for a second time. There must have been something the first time he was here that caused him to get on a ship twice more to come back. My father never wanted to be sent back. That was such a declaration. We're here. I'm bringing my family here in that period of time because of the Chinese Exclusion Act, there were laws in other parts of the country that didn't allow Asians to own property. 
that's the unusual thing about Chinatowns all over the country, right? The Chinatowns existed because those were the areas where we were allowed to actually live. It's not necessarily the places that would have been our choice. Chinatown was a ghetto. We were forced to live there. And, you know, if you read about the land, what we occupy in New York City, Jacob Rees said it was such a horrific slum that he suggested to the city that the entire area be razed to the ground. So we have many stories like this, along with other um, storytelling types on our website. Um, I'm also really excited to announce, I just haven't done this publicly yet, but we're actually launching a new online site called Chinatown Studio later this summer. This will be in partnership with our, the launch of our physical studio that we're working uh, on renovations at the moment. And so all of our projects will be showcased on this new site. But for now, you can go to Chinatown.org and click around and see a lot of these stories. And so why storytelling is so important is that it really builds um, trust in the neighborhood. So the person who's you know, sharing the story earlier, Jan Lee, he's an activist, you know, a very avid, like a very active member in Chinatown. And we everyone has a different opinion of ways of doing things. Let's just say that, you know, to create, not everyone agrees on every single little thing. But um, because we started off with a storytelling project with Jan, uh, we've been in alignment. He trusts us. He knows that we took the time to listen and to honor his story. Um, and that is the building block of activism within a community, I really think. And we've built off of that um, for more of our community engagement work. Um, we were talking earlier, Ernie um, and Cheryl and I were talking about how we don't really learn about community engagement through academia, you know, as architects. Um, and that's a big reason, actually, why I took off my architect hat and became a community organizer, because I wasn't seeing that our community was engaged with in a just or even impactful way. And being a resident of Chinatown, I would watch the city come through and try to do projects at us. And it just didn't seem like it was the best way. <laughs> and I was realizing there was no space for us to do this work. And instead, we had to create that space. Yes, of course, I'm funded to do it ourselves. And um, that's when I started Big Chinatown with some other friends in the neighborhood. But we actually didn't do it to start Big Chinatown. We just did it to start doing community engagement process to report back to the city and think this is what we want from the community. We didn't know that was an organization yet. Um, but this is all built up to um, our latest publication that we've actually done in collaboration with the city, with the small department of small business services. It's the commercial district needs assessment, which actually informs um, people who make decisions about the budget, people who make decisions about policy in our city, about what our needs are from our perspective. So in the nerdiest possible way, this was like our form of activism, where he said, like, this is what we need. Um, listen to us. Um, here's this whole report. And it was a year-long project of lots of on-the-ground research, um, focus groups, just counting the pavement, talking to um, shop owners, talking to small property owners. Um, and it's a big report, but the thing I really want to focus on is that our Chinatown is a, it's a whole ecosystem. Um, it not only, I don't know how much you guys know about Manhattan Chinatown, but the impacts I feel like are reached all the way here. There's a, um, a wholesale produce uh, ecosystem. You see wholesalers financing, um, the production of vegetables all across the U.S. and in Canada and Mexico. And that network is dispersed all along the East Coast. Um, we see, um, you know, our food vendors, our street vendors, um, who operate on really low margins, very low area entry for capital, um, really support uh, our community uh, through affordable food. 
So if this whole ecosystem and all of it needs to be supported, and that's the main takeaway, the, the report is available online too if you'd like to take a look. All right, so I wanted to end by talking about our kitchen classes um, for diasporic cultures. I think we all know food is that anchoring tie to culture and heritage. Um, food is such a great way to bring people in and engage with their culture. Um, and as my mom can tell you, food has always captured my attention. I love eating. So in our classes, we invite aunties from Chinatown to come and teach culture through food. And we acknowledge them as culture bearers and give value to their knowledge. Often times women's work, quote unquote, is undervalued. Um, but we know that women have traditionally held space for um, they continue cultural practices and traditions. They're often the keepers of rituals and stories. And most importantly, we know how stories come when the food is on the table, when you know, you're all eating together, when you're drinking tea, that's where the stories come out. Um, it's also a place to deepen uh, our understanding of our heritage, just learn more about the ingredients, the practices. I was talking to a shopkeeper in Chinatown, and she was thinking about, you know, all of her shoppers are usually an older generation, and she's worried that the younger generation wouldn't know what these different um, you know, medicinal herbs are or how to use them or these ingredients. So it's kind of our training camp to you know, train the next generation of Chinatown Nazis. And so through the support of Mellon Foundation and um, state funding, uh, we're really excited to announce that we're embarking on the next phase of our organization. We're creating a flexible space to house our kitchen classes. I uh, will have workshops, um, tea programs. I'm really lucky to have two tea educators on my team and um, continue our art exhibition. That looks really cool. <laughs> This is how it looks now. Um, meanwhile, since you know renovations are slated for later this summer, if you're in New York City, please come by and join us in our studio. We're already programming, it's already full all the time. Um, come check out our new our current exhibition, which is called A Place for Us is a Photography Exhibition. There's 50 plus pieces, a lot of writing about uh, that's related to the, the commercial district needs. Um, and we'll have tastings, talks, workshops. And we'll be opening our summer season of outdoor programming soon. Um, our first block party of the year is going to be on Father's Day. So hopefully my dad will come. Uh, our DJ Rochelle, she has the bathing collection that comes from many of our Chinatown community members. They're all old vinyl that come from Hong Kong, Taiwan, Malaysia, China. Um, so these are all songs that kind of are in our collective memories, and it's very intergenerational, and it's just super fun in the, in the neighborhood. So come and celebrate with us. We're well, definitely happy to see you there. And it's a long process, and many people are proud of it. So 
there, even before the recording starts, there's a lot of trust building that needs to So this year we identified we wanted to do two stories. One on the inclusion needs and urban experience, um, which often kind of is the domestic immigration. Um, and so this relationship building has really started through relationship with the inclusion needs worker group. We help them every year to for their arts funding, city arts funding grant. So they know us, you know, we, we, we collaborate with them in performances. We've made a video for them. And through that process, we came to know their individual stories and identified like which auntie has been an amazing story that <laughs> needs to be recorded. Um, and so it's a long process of getting someone to share such a delicate story with you. Um, and another sort of way security, which is often not seen. Um, I think. It, Later, but I think there is this economy for people that unseat how in insecurity is a nation. It is a big story about it, but it's just specifically in China's country, which is typically where there is lower socioeconomic class. It's really important to make sure that it's part of a wider. Yeah. Uh, my question is um, like, first of all, I think I really admire how many layers you have um, for, of activities and community engagement. So I'm wondering, like, what the key to growing like your team and all of these different facets that you've grown. Um, yeah, what do you think the key was to like grow all of this? I think you identified it. Is the team. <laughs> um, I think what has maybe to bring it back to being a designer, what has helped me through building this team is understanding the concept and letting go of it. So, like shaping the framework of what would be the strategy and the goals we want to achieve, but then also giving each team member enough autonomy to one. Feel like it's their baby too, and that they can use, and to really let their expertise shine. So we have a storytelling team lead that takes this really delicate process that I just explained to Ernie. I am not that person. I'm I am allowed on T. Like I am not like that sensitive, you know, listener um, that I'm like kind of shouting or <laughs> now directing people to do this and that. And or in, uh, for instance, we also have another teammate who has. Uh, her, her family runs, she's born and raised in Chinatown. Her family runs a store in Chinatown, and so she has this perspective very deeply of the Chinese. And so she brings a lot of that understanding to the team and how to outreach to the region. So it's also being very clear and sh sharing your values so that the right team finds you as well. And also, the identity of your team, I think, really matters. Somehow, we're all women, and we work really well together. Um, but, you know, I, it, we all have very different backgrounds. Sorry for my ignorance, but I've heard Monty multiple times. Can you explain what that is? Is that literal answer? I mean, so in Chinese culture, we usually refer to our elders, even if they're not related to us, as auntie or uncle. Um, and so we, you know, if you see someone who's a generation above you in the neighborhood, you just address them that way, even if you first time ever met them. Um, but it's also kind of like, uh, you know, what's the thing that they do from the beginning and they have files, you know, like, you know, person profile, you know, it's like they're, you know, uh, and our neighbors, you know, who are older, they, they finish like another persona, persona, yeah. 
And it's funny, we've actually um, started making the swag <laughs> with like bags and stuff that's just like kind of sound auntie and training. <laughs> because it really is what we all want to aspire to be. And maybe before in the past, it wasn't like an aspirational thing. Uh, we really want to flip that and honor them. And say, this, is, this is awesome. This is the light. We want to do what we want to do. Yes. Um, so, when you're telling stories, different groups and people have different contradictory views about you know, the history you know, or what they want in their neighborhoods. Of our programming. So, how do you guys sort of um, you know, satisfy these different views of the empire? Do you think this is? For me, it's really Emma and I'm not making a judgment. Putting all of those stories in a place where they can be that are December, but yeah, no, I mean, I mean, there's, there's a lot of